Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shadi Hassan. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm a general dentist. I've been working with three diagnostics for the past five years as a senior treatment planning consultant. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, and I hope you, your family, and loved ones are staying safe and healthy during these difficult times. Um, today's webinar is going to be about advanced computer guided implant treatment planning, which is basically going to be a continuation of our previous webinar where we had a simple two implant case planned using a planning software. Well, this is going to be similar, but it is going to be a bit more complex since we're going to be talking about full arch rehabilitation. To watch our previous webinar, you can visit our YouTube channel, 3D Diagnostics, where you're going to find all the webinars posted in the page and additional videos that I think will be very helpful as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box down below. I'm going to try our best to answer all your questions throughout the webinar. If not, if we don't have enough time, we're going to be sending you an email with all the questions, with all the answers to your questions in a couple of days. I would like to welcome you again and thank you for attending. Now, for those of you who don't know 3 Diagnostics, 3 Diagnostics is a company that has been providing dental digital support services since 2005. Um, since then, we have processed well over 100,000 cases with thousands of our doctors. We mainly focus on providing turnkey solutions, and we have a dedicated customer support service that is available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time zone during weekdays, and that also includes in-house dentists to help you with any of your technical questions. So what are our services and products? Um, implant treatment planning services that, as mentioned, is done by um, our in-house dentists either online or offline, um, surgical guides, teeth, bone, and tissue supported surgical guides, guided full mouth restorations, comprehensive radiology reports, implant planning software, which is the code diagnostics, the planning software we're gonna be using today, 3D printers that you can use in your office to print your guides, which is called a Ucreate, and personal protective equipment such as the KN95 mask and face shield for your protection and safety in your, clin in your clinic or dental office. With that being said, we're going to be moving on to today's topics. Um, we did discuss most of the points in previous webinars, so we're just going to briefly go over the points, and we're going to be discussing 3D imaging, what are the images we need, um, dual scan protocol, what it is and how it's done, full arch rehabilitation, we're going to be talking about the treatment plan options we have for our patients, and finally, there's going to be a live demonstration planning complex cases using a software. So starting with 3D imaging, uh, what are the images we need? Um, cone beam CT. Um, if you have a cone beam machine in your office, you'd scan your patient and get DICOMs. If you don't have a machine, you refer the patient out to a scanning center, which again would scan the patient and provide you with DICOM data. Those DICOMs would then be imported into the software and will provide you, provide you to see the patient scan so you can manipulate and plan. The second information we need is actually dependent on the type of arch. So we have two different scenarios here. On the left-hand side, we've got a patient that comes into the office with a full set of teeth or partially edentulous. In this situation, you're gonna be taking cone beam CT and an impression or an SDL file of the arch of interest. Um, of course, ideally, we would like to have the opposing SDL or impression and a bite, but it's just okay to have the patient's arch of interest itself. And on the right-hand side, the patient comes in completely dentulous with a denture. And as you can see here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a CBCT scan of the patient wearing the denture and a CBCT scan of the denture alone. And before we place the denture or just before we scan the patient with the denture, we're going to be placing radiographic markers on. As right here, seen in the picture, we have some white dots or radiopaque markers. Those are the markers we stick on the denture. And again, we advise the patient to bite on cotton rolls. You can also see the radiopacity of the cotton rolls right here. And then once that's done, you take the denture out and you scan the denture with the exact same positions of the radiographic markers alone. So you're gonna have two sets of DICOM data or scans, one with the patient's denture and one with the patient wearing the denture. So this here is a picture of a denture with radi radiographic markers. Again, what you do is you stick those markers on the denture buccally and lingually or on the palatal surface. Um, you need at least four to six on the buccal surface and four to six on the lingual. 
And this here is a picture showing you up close how the rated graphic markers look like. And as you can see also, this is just um, a glass bead that has less artifacts or just generates less artifacts in the scan so the, um, the software could render the rated pick markers without any problems. I would just like to note that if the patient, either the patient has an existing denture or if you're gonna be fabricating a new one just as a scanning appliance, you always need to make sure that the denture is gonna be made completely out of acrylic and we should not have any metal framework in the denture. The reason why is that metal generates a lot of artifacts and scattering, which would definitely affect the uh, surgical guide design process and of course the accuracy of the guide. Another thing also which is important, if the patient comes in with the existing denture, even if it's recently fabricated, we always need to make sure that the denture is relined using a soft rated lucent reliner, and that is just to avoid any air gaps or spaces between the patient's intaglio and the soft tissue, just to make sure that the denture is going to be entirely seated and supported on the tissue. Now, once we're done, we just take those DICOM data, we import them into the software, and we stitch both scans together into one, and this is how the final result is going to look like. A patient scan, you can see the patient's arch and also the denture in place. And we're going to be using those radio pick markers to stitch, to, uh, stitch the scans together. So, right now, we're going to be talking about full arch rehabilitation and the types of surgical procedures and treatment plans we can have or offer our patients. So, that depends, of course, on a lot of things. So, as mentioned before, the patient's either going to come in with teeth or is going to be completely dentulous. Uh, for completely dentureless patients, uh, the chief complaint would be just the denture just um, keeps rocking and they want to have something more fixed. So that also needs to be taken into account. Um, what you're going to do also is you're going to, depending on the guidelines and depending on the treatment plan you want to offer your patient, we're going to be planning and seeing which option would just be better for a patient to be offered. So we have two types of prostheses or restorations. We have two different approaches. The one on the left side here is a fixed prosthesis. And what you basically do is you place implants with good enough AP sped to cover the whole arch. And then you're gonna provide the patient with um, a hybrid denture or a bridge that is gonna be screwed in. And the patient's not gonna be able to take the denture out or the prosthesis out. Versus of course, the other treatment plan option, which is the removable prosthesis. And the difference here, as you can see, that the removal prosthesis has flanges, buccally and lingually, and this could be removed by the patient. So it is gonna be with housings in the intaglio, and the implants are gonna be restored with locators or ball head attachments that are gonna be connected to the housings so the patients can take them out and snap them back in, and that's gonna be easier for cleaning. So for the fixed prosthesis approach, um, According to Dr. Carl Misch, we have three classifications. So we have an FP1, FP2, and FP3 restorations. We're going to start with the first one, FP1 restorations. So an FP1 restores the clinical crown, and that's in case if the patient has good vertical bone on a, and height, you can just restore the clinical crown. Um, the next classification is FP2, where the bone is a bit more compromised. You can see that there is a bit more or significant bone loss vertically. And that type of prosthesis would restore the clinical crown and a part of the coronal third of the root. And finally, an FP3, in this case, which would be this prosthesis here, we've seen earlier, um, that restores the clinical crown and the gingiva where, where there is, um, there's a adequate bone loss and you don't have enough vertical height. So knowing that before we go into the planning, this is gonna be really important. And what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna move on to the planning software so we can demonstrate how we plan either an overdenture or a plan for an overdenture or a fixed prosthesis. Before we move on, we're just gonna pause for a couple of minutes to see if there is any questions. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so I don't think there are any questions, so let's move on. So we're going to be starting today with the plan for the removal of prosthesis. And, um, and that's according to a lot of, a lot of factors. So uh, according to literature, uh, the absolute minimum would be two implants in the corner of the mouth at the canine sites. Um, but again, that would be 
according to your preference as well. You can place two, um, two or more implants. You can place actually four or five implants. That depends if we have the patient has good bone enough or just the distance between the mental foramina is also enough to accommodate more than two implants. So um, also according to Dr. Carl Misch, you can place three implants at sites A, C, and E. So the canines, which are A and E, and C would be the midline of the arch. So what we're going to be doing today, um, we're going to be placing four implants and we're going to be using Strawman. So this is, first of all, how the scan looks like. So this is the patient's denture. You can also see the radiopaque markers stuck on the denture. And before we go into the planning part, I just want to show you how this is registered to the scan so you'd know how the stitching goes. So right now, if we just zoom in and move up and down in the slices, you can notice that you can see the radiopaque markers in the patient's scan, and you can also see the outline of that radiopaque marker on the denture, which is outlined in pink. And that is the one on the buccal surface. The other thing we can also see is the shadow of the patient's dentition on the denture right over here. And what we want to make sure of is the line being perfectly matching with the outline of the anatomy right here on the lingual surface as well. And we're going to also take a closer look from the cross section right over here. So again, we can see the patient's anatomy or the dentition, the shadow, the phalanges buccally and lingually. And right here, we can also see um, the relining material. So right here, we can see the rate opacity of the relining and this denture was relined, of course. And that is visible from the cross section. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to be placing four implants. Uh, these are the four implants we placed. Um, we've decided to place them at the sites of the bicuspids, the first bicuspids and the lateral incisors. We're going to take a closer look at the occlusal view. And we have some criteria for designing or guidelines for designing a case to accommodate an overdenture. First of all, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have enough vertical clearance. Again, according to literature, we need around 10 to 12 millimeters from the implants platform to the occlusal table to have enough, enough bulk for the prosthesis and enough bulk to place the housings in, into, into the denture. So that is the first thing. The second thing is that we want to make sure that the implants are planned as perfectly uh, as parallel to, to each other. And that is going to be for two things. One will be easier for the denture pickup and two would be easier for the, for the patient to remove the denture and place it back in. Um, now, actually, if you have more uh, um, angulation difference between the implants, that could still be compensated with um, locator attachments that could restore up to 40 degrees um, of an angulation difference. But I mean, the ideal solution would be just planning the implants as parallel as possible. So right now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the implant sites, starting with the anterior implants. Let's check out number 23 first. Let's zoom out and see how the cross-sectional view looks like. So this is a 4.1 by 10 millimeter Strauman implant. First thing we want to do here, again, as we've mentioned before, is make sure that the distance from the implant's platform all the way to the occlusal table or the incisal edge is more than 10 or around 10 to 12 millimeters. Uh, right now, it looks like we've got around 13 and a half millimeters, which is more than enough, which is OK. Again, as long as the distance is more than 10, it should be really good. So that's the first thing we made sure of. The second thing, we also made sure that the implants are perfectly parallel. And right now, we do see the implants midline or center. So the most important thing, thing here also is to place the implant in a position or in an angulation to have the center emerging more or less out of the center of the intaglio. The reason why we want to do that is we're going to be placing housing, housings in the denture, and we want to make sure that there's going to be enough acrylic support for those housings. So the most or the best position to have the implant emerging out of the denture would be the center because this is where the most bulk of the prosthesis is. Um, if you tip the implant a bit towards the lingual surface or the buccal surface, then the housing should be here, which means that you're still going to have to do some adjustments and bulk up the lingual flange a bit, which sometimes could be just uncomfortable for the patient. So with that being said, we're going to make sure that the implant is exactly in the center. That was number 23. Looks like the bone support is really good around it. A bit subcrestal though, but we can still push the implant a bit more towards the crest. And again, we're going to move on to number 26 and also check how it looks like. Again, that is a 4.1 by 10. Looks really good. And 
if you've noticed that the center of the implant is also emerging out of the center of the intaglio, which you can see right over here. So those were the two anterior implants. We're gonna be moving right now to the distal ones. Right now, number 28 a 4.1 by 10. You can even place a 4.8 by 10, but again, since those implants are gonna be only used for retention, you just don't wanna have them too big or too wide. 3.3 or 4.1 millimeter implants would do. Um, I think we have a question here. Um, I thought that the 10 to 15 millimeter distance was calculated for implant platform to single them, not in size of edges. Well, um, what I do know is that the distance should be to the occlusal table. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be measuring to the occlusal table. So for example, number 28, the distance here from the platform to the occlusal table. So let's say the lingual cusp of the bicuspid, which is right over here, that it's still, it's still around 12 millimeters. So again, as long as, as, as we've covered or just cleared the 10 millimeter distance, it should be good. So that was number 28. Again, the bone support looks really good around it. You've got good distance away from the lingual plate and the buccal plate, everything looks good. I'm gonna also check the distal implant on the other side, number 21. And this also is a 4.1 by 10, looks really good. You can actually see how dense the bone is. And there's a tool in this software that allows me to measure the density or uh, in terms of Hounsfield units. So the Hounsfield units right here are almost close to 800 to 900 Hounsfield units, which is around D2 bone on the lingual surface. Buckley, it is almost the same. Actually, it is around 1200 Hounsfield units. So this is around D1 bone. So right now, we've made sure both, all four implants look good in the bone. We're gonna just take a closer look at the occlusal view. We can still try to spread out the implants a bit, push them more distal, but I don't wanna have the implants too close to the anterior loop. So even though they're 10 millimeters long, I just want, don't wanna make sure the implants are gonna be more than two or three millimeters away from the, uh, from the loop. And for an overdenture, you don't need that much AP sped. Four implants would do the job and retain the denture in position. So once we're done placing the implants, once they look good and parallel, what we're gonna do right now for the planning of the surgical guide, we're gonna be placing fixation pins because those are the um, pins that are gonna be holding the guide down. Uh, the reason why we place fixation pins is if we just uh, rely on the support on the tissue, as you all know, the soft tissue gives and a bit resilient. So those, I mean, the, the, uh, the guide is now gonna be 100% seated. What we're gonna be doing, these fixation pins are gonna be planted into the bone, just like that at a 45 degree angle. We're gonna be placing them as deep as possible to engage more bone as possible. And sometimes we would just try to have the fixation pin engage a bit of the lingual plate cause it's a bit denser and that would just make sure that the fixation pin is gonna be a bit more rigid and more stable. So we usually recommend placing more than three fixation pins, so four, and we're gonna be placing them between the implants as you can see here, at a 45 degree angle. And once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and design the surgical guide, of course, after placing the sleeves for the implants. So that is how to plan an overdenture in the lower arch. We do also have another arch, which is the upper arch. And we're gonna be basically just planning it the same way. The only difference between the upper and lower arches is the vital structures and the anatomy that you can find in each of the arches. So for the upper arch, the absolute minimum, again, according to literature, would be around four implants. Um, and that's completely different from the mandible. The reason why they would say two implants is that the bone is a bit more denser um, in, the, in the mandible. So two implants at the quarter of the mouth would be enough uh, versus of course the upper, the bone is a lot softer. So four implants would be better to just have as absolute minimum. So we're gonna be placing here five implants. Again, you can place more if there is enough bone and that is according to your preference and the guidelines you follow. We're gonna be placing four implants. Here are the implants from the 3D view. Again, they're all straight up and down. They're almost 100% accurate or just um, parallel to each other except for that implant here. The difference, where there's a tool in this software that would allow me to measure the difference in the angles between the implants. And it says that the difference in the angle between on uh, the implant at site number 10 or 11 is around 6.2 degrees from the rest of the implants, which is less than 10 degrees, still acceptable, and restore all um, implants with straight or just um, locators that are straight. 
let me just place the fifth implant. Okay, so we're going to be all going over each implant site, starting with the one to study on the patient's right side. So what we've placed here is a 4.1 by 8. The reason why we had an 8 millimeter implant is because there is pneumatization in the sinus and we would not be able to place it deeper. So what I would do here is I would place the implant virtually to have it just right below or just a millimeter shy from the floor of the sinus. And clinically, what I would do is I would just do a very minor sinus bump approach and just bump the sinus and place the implant at a more apical position without even grafting. So since we don't have enough vertical height, we're gonna do that. And the implant's gonna end up being in this position after the sinus bump. Completely secured right now. And you've got around a millimeter to 1.5 millimeters of the apex in the sinus. So that was number five. We'll move on to number seven. This is a 3.3 by 12. The reason why you use the 3.3 is that the bone is not gonna be enough to accommodate a 4.1 with the recommended distance away from the buccal and the lingual plates, which is around 1.5 to 2 millimeters. So if we take a measurement from the facial threads to the facial plate, that is around 1.9 to 2 millimeters, which is safe enough and would prevent having any exposures in the future. And we're gonna also rotate around the implant, make sure it's not really close to any of the vital structures. You've got the nasal cavity here, completely away and also away from the medial of the sinus. So that is number seven. We did add one more implant in the midline, and I just wanna show you how this looks like from the axial view. And that implant is in the midline, as mentioned, right buckle to the nasopatine, but as long as we're not encroaching on the nerve, it should be okay. So here it is, and this is where the nasopatine is. Again, we're gonna to try to maintain 1.5 millimeters or more away from the nasopatine. It looks like we've got 1.7 millimeters which is good enough. And the distance away from the facial plate will be even more than two millimeters. So in terms of distance, everything looks good. And let's see how that implant looks like from the cross section right here. Again, that is a 3.3 by 12. Looks really good. We've got more than enough distance away from both the buckle and the lingual plates. And as you can see, also the center of the implant is emerging more or less to the center of the intaglio where the acrylic is just bulk enough to accommodate the housing, which would be around four millimeters for the housing. Um, moving on to number 10 or number 11. This also is a 3.3 by 12. The bone, as you can see, is a lot softer here. So if we just go ahead and try to measure the density, this is gonna be almost around 200 to 300 house units, which is around D4 or D3 bone. And that would require me knowing that, of course, before I go in, which is give me more idea of what I need to have done as a, an additional surgical procedure, which in, my, in this case, I would do some bone expansion or some ridge expansion for undersizing of the osteotomy. So that was the fourth implant. And finally here is number 12 with the distal implant on the left side. It's a 4.1 by 10. Looks like the vertical height here is a lot better than the other side. And we place the implant in a more or just a better position and it's still gonna be engaging the floor of the sinus, which is not gonna be a problem. As long as you're not encroaching on the sinus in the software, it should be okay clinically. So in the end, we end up with five implants, pretty good. We've got good AP spread and good distribution between the implants, and that should be more than enough to retain an overdenture on the top. Again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and place fixation pins between those implants at a 45 degree angle, as you can see here. And that's just to hold the guide down, either if it's going to be tissue supported or even bone supported. So it doesn't um, matter whether we have a dual scan or not. We usually use a dual scan for um, the planning purposes or just taking the uh, dentition and the denture as reference. But if you still want to go ahead and have a bone supported guide, we can still do that or tissue that also could be made. So that was the part where we were designed a case for an overdenture. Let's move on right now to a more complex uh, plan, which is the fixed prosthesis. And the fixed prosthesis has different guidelines and different classifications, as we mentioned before. So going in to plan a fixed prosthesis, you'd need to know more information. So again, whether the patient has existing teeth or completely dentulous, you'd know what you need to do. So for example, we selected um, to use a case or a scan with patient having teeth. So what we're gonna be doing here is, first of all, we're gonna make sure that the vertical clearance is gonna be enough to accommodate a fixed prosthesis. 
again, according to literature, fixed prosthesis would require around 15 to 17 millimeters occlusal clearance, whether it is out from the platform of the implant to the occlusal table or the closest point of emergence, which we're going to be seeing right now. So that is the first thing we do. Um, the number of the implants could vary, again, depending on your preference and the guidelines you follow. Some would recommend um, just an all in X approach with a minimum of four implants. So four implants, two straight up and down at the canine sites and two terminal ones uh, that are either 17 or 30 degree distally inclined to have enough apris bed. And again, if you have more than, uh, or just a distance would be enough to accommodate more than four implants, you can go ahead and place five. Um, if the bone looks better distal to the foramina, you can actually place up to six or seven or eight implants that are all gonna be straight up and down, and that would be better apis bed. You would not need to tip the, uh, the implant distally because you've, co you've covered most of the sites or the area of the arch up to the first molar occlusion, which then you would not need to angle the implants. What we're gonna be doing right now is I've chosen to also place four implants on the bottom, and that is gonna be an all in four approach. So this is how the implants would look like. What we've done here since the patient has dentition is we've took a CT scan and we recorded the, uh, the anatomy by either taking impressions or intraoral scans. And what we've done is we've taken the arch of interest, the opposing and the bite. So right now you can see that the patient's upper and lower models are articulated virtually. And that is because of the bite we also imported into the, into the software. So what I'm gonna do right now is gonna start with number 20. So these sites are 20, 23, 26, and 29. And here is a better view from the panel. So you can see where those sites are. We're gonna start with number 23. And those also are Stroman implants. So that is a 4.1 by 12. And again, since we know that the patient has existing teeth and we wanna maintain that 15 to 17 millimeters occlusal difference or restorative height, I would know going in that I would need to do some bone expand, I mean, some um, um, bone reduction since the implants are gonna be placed deeper to maintain that distance. So right now, if we go ahead and measure the distance from the platform of that implant to the incisal edge, that is gonna be around 17.4, and to the cingulum where the emergence is, that is gonna be around 14, which is still acceptable. But what we usually do is measure the distance to the incisal edge. So, Right now we've got a 4.1 by 12. The reason why we use a longer implant is to make sure that the implant is gonna be engaging more bone apical to the socket, just to have the implant more stable at the time of placement. And right here, we also pushed it a bit closer to the lingual plate, just to have some of the lingual threads, at least apically or the middle third, engage a bit of that denser lingual plate to end up having the implant more stable to ensure that you're gonna have primary stability for the implant. So whether you wanna go ahead and just um, immediately load the implants or just have the implant stable enough to have better prognosis in the future. So that was the first implant. What we've done here is we planned the implant to emerge out of the cingulum. Again, the reason why we have it emerge out of the cingulum is when we place in the screw holes, we want to have them a bit more towards the lingual, just aesthetically more pleasing, and you're not going to have the access hole towards the buccal surface. Sometimes that is just a bit difficult to fill, even if you're going to fill it with composite. So more towards the lingual surface. And right now the center is almost just out of the cingulum perfectly. And the bone support looks really good. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate around the implant. Let's see how the bone support looks around it. And right now we've noticed that the implant is just mostly below the socket of number 23. And that would just determine that the implant is, given of course what you see in the scan, is gonna have a good primary stability. So that is number 23. Let's move on to 26. 26 also is a 4.1 by 12. Again, we placed it at the site of number 26 or just right this to number 26 a bit. And here again is the cross section. Same thing we've done. We've pushed the implant a bit closer to the lingual plate to make sure that we engage a bit of the denser lingual plate. And the emergence is out of the cingulum. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a measurement from the platform to the incisal ledge, and that is almost around 16.5 millimeters. If we rotate, you're gonna notice that both those implants are planned almost more or less at the same platform height, so same depth, and you've got a distance of almost around seven millimeters to the crest. So uh, what you're gonna need to know going in, 
that you have around seven millimeters to alveolo crest is that you need to do some bone reduction and that will be around six to six and a half millimeters of bone reduction. So those are the two anterior implants. Pretty simple, pretty easy. We're gonna move right, right now to the distal ones. Let's see how, how the distal one on the left side looks like. And what we've done here is we've angled that implant around 30 degrees towards the distal. The reason why we've done that is we wanna maintain or have more AP spread so we can cantilever up to the first molar occlusion since, or just sometimes the patients do not have enough bone that is gonna be adequate enough to place straight implants distal to the foramina. So we substitute that with angling the implants. So that is a 4.8 by 12. The reason why we have a 4.8 is since those implants, the terminal implants are gonna act as, um, or just most of the cantilever forces are gonna fall on those implants uh, I personally would like to have them a bit wider because that is going to be more surface area and that is going to be, of course, better um, retention and rigidity for the prosthesis and for the cantilever forces. So 4.8 by 12, here is how the implant looks like from the cross section. I place it pretty much in the center of the ridge and you can also check the patient's occlusion here. If we bring in the upper model, you can see that the patient has a class one occlusion and we had the center of the implant emerging more or less out of the central fossa where the opposing uh, pathocusp or the functional cusp is gonna be uh, occluding. And that is to have the forces falling along the long axis of the implant more or less from a cross-sectional. And it looks really good. We've got more than two or three millimeters around from the lingual plate to the buccal plate. And right here, if we move up to the mesial distal view, we can actually see the anterior loop right over here. And I wanna make sure that the distance we've got away from the anterior loop is gonna be more than two or three millimeters. Again, just to stay safe and prevent any complications. So I'm gonna go ahead and measure right now the distance. And that looks like it's around four to four and a half millimeters away, which is um, uh, safe as we can get from the nerve. And we can still have, um, we do have enough room to push the implant more distal if you want, if we have, wanna have better AP spread. But I think the AP spread we have right now looks good. And I'm gonna show you in a minute how to calculate or just how to get the, um, the AP spread of the plan you have right now and how much you can can't leave it distal on each side. So that is the distal implant on the left side, 4.8 by 12. Let's see how the, uh, the other implant looks like right here. That again is a 4.8 by 12 also. Here's a cross-sectional view. Again, the bone is really wide. We have more three to, uh, three to four millimeters away from the buccal and the lingual plates. And we also made sure that the center of the implant is going to be emerging more or less out of the central fossa towards the functional cusp of the opposing molar. And right now, we can go ahead and also measure the angle difference between those two distal implants to the anterior implants by clicking on this tool here, which automatically calculates the distance or the angle difference. And it says right now it is around 30 degrees exactly. So what I want to do right now, this software has actually um, a stock abutment that you can place on the implants. So if I go ahead and place a stock abutment that is gonna be a multi-unit 30 degree abutment to see how the prosthesis or the angulation of the implant is gonna look like later. Okay. So here, that uh, again, most companies have a 17 or a 30 degree multi-unit abutment. So we're gonna be using the 30 unit multi-unit here and okay so let's remove the upper sdl for a second so if we just rotate around the arch right now you can see the multi-unit being placed over the implant so this yellow cylinder that is emerging in the same long axis of the implant that is the center of the implant whereas this right here this is the long axis of the screw channel or just the, um, the, um, the channel that the prosthesis is gonna be screwed in. So if we also take a quick look at the close of view, they're gonna be pretty much same or just close to parallelism, local linguity, just a couple of uh, degrees off. And from the facial view, you can actually see that they're being perfectly parallel. Again, this is gonna be a lot easier when you screw in the abutment and everything looks good right now with all four implants. So what we're gonna do right now Lastly is we're gonna measure the AP spread just to see how much we've got and how much we can can't leave or distal in each side. So to measure the AP spread, what we need to do is we open up the axial view and you can actually see all four implants on the top. 
So we're going to be drawing a line crossing the midline of both the anterior implants. And then we're going to draw another line crossing the distal aspect of the distally inclined implants, just like that. So right now we've got two lines. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure a distance from the top line crossing the two anterior implants to the bottom line that is crossing the distal aspect. And this is around 11 millimeters. So right now, if we calculate 11 millimeters times 1.5, because this is the amount of or the uh, how much distance or how much um, um, you can can't leave on each side, you're going to have or end up with 16.5 millimeters on each side which would be either a small bicuspid and a molar crown, knowing the dimensions of the molars could be sometimes nine to 10 millimeters. The bicuspids could be small as seven or six millimeters. Knowing that before you go ahead and finalize and process the guide that with the final placement of the implants, you can can't lever up to a first molar occlusion. So you can have a second bicuspid and a first molar occlusion on each side. So this is how we measure the AP spread. And again, that is only by just placing four implants, which is the least minimum implants you can place for a fixed prosthesis in the lower and also the upper arches. But as we've mentioned before, you can have a lot of plans. You can have uh, more than four implants, up to six implants if you want, according to your preference and according on how you want to do this. So we're going to be checking another plan. Um, and that will be according to the guidelines Dr. Carl Mish gave us before. So. Um, they recommend that we can place five implants at sites A, B, C, D, and E. Um, let's move on to the other plan. And what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna check the other plan, and that is gonna be according to the guidelines Dr. Mish gave us, and we're gonna be comparing the AP spread. So that would be the difference between this plan and the other, is that the other plan we had, this are the inclined implants. Here, we have straight up and down implants at sites A, B, C, D, and E. So C is the midline of the arch, uh, B and D will be the canine sites, and A and E will be the first or second bicuspid sites. So right now, we have five straight up and down implants between the mentoframina. We're gonna also check how those implants look like really quickly from the cross-sectional view. We're gonna start with the distal one on the left side, number 20. You can see here that it's going to be placed between the sockets of both the first and second bicuspids. And from the cross-section of view, it looks really good. Again, we've made sure that the center of the implant is going to be emerging more or less towards the functional cusp of the opposing dentition. Looks really good. We have or cleared more than three or four millimeters away from the nerve. Here's that actually is around five and a half millimeters. Really good. You've got a good distance away from the lingual plate. And here is the next implant. That's the one at site D. Um, it's a 4.1 by 12. Looks really good. Here again is the cross section. The bone support is more than two millimeters on both sides and emerging out of the cingulum, as you can see. And that is the one here in the midline of the arch where we've got the lingual foramen. So this is why we have a 10 millimeter implant. Sometimes we, try to, uh, we try to avoid the lingual foramen, but um, yeah, we've got a 4.1 by 10. Again, the emergence is out of the cingulum, good bone support on both sides. And this is the next implant. And finally, number 29. Again, you can see the distance we got away from the nerve is more than five and a half millimeters, around six. And yeah, really good bone support, book of linguity, and same concept, just emerging out of the central fossa. So let me just show you a closer view of how those implants look like. Again, they're pretty much. Um, I think they're perfectly parallel to each other. So we have them emerging out of the first and second bicuspid or the first bicuspids on each side, the canine sites and one in the midline. And let's go ahead and measure or just see how much AP spread we have to see how much we can can't leave on each side. So what we're gonna do right now, again, same thing. We're gonna draw a line crossing the distal aspect of the implants. We've got placed posteriorly right here and another line crossing the midline of the most anterior implant. And we're gonna draw a line between them both. And that is around 13 millimeters. So 13, again, what we need to know right now is we multiply that by 1.5. And what is, uh, what is uh, the result is how much you can can't leave on each side. So with a 13 millimeter distance between both lines, we have around 19.5 millimeters of the succant lever, which is gonna be even more than the distally inclined approach. 
So 19.5, you can easily restore a nine millimeter or a 10 millimeter molar crown and a eight or nine millimeter um, bicuspid. So this is just to show you that you don't need to distally incline the implants. Again, depending on how you approach the case, depending on the guidelines you follow and how you'd like to plan your own cases, you can actually achieve the same EP spread or even better. Um, again, just, um, I'm just gonna mention again that you can place two more implants or even more if the bone support would allow you to place those implants distal to the foramina. So you can add one more implant, this on each side, to the foramina, and as long as they're at the same platform and the same bone support is around them, it's good. You can go ahead and place more if you want. And then, of course, you don't need to measure the AP spread because you've covered the whole arch and placed those implants distally where you want them. So there's not going to be too much cantilever, or there's not going to be cantilever whatsoever. So again, what we do then, once we're done, we place fixation pins between the implants at a 45 degree angle, and we place the sleeves on top of these implants, and then we go ahead and process the guide. Um, the only difference we have with the fixed prosthesis plan is if the patient's still dentulous, you need to have bone reduction done. And of course, the reason why is that you're not, or just most of the cases would not have too much vertical bone loss. So you still have enough bone above the platforms of the implant because you're going to be placing them a bit deeper to achieve that 15 to 17 millimeter vertical clearance. So you'd need to just shave off uh, all the bone off and make sure that the platform or the level of the bone is going to be lower. Um, if we just did that with the other case where the patient was completely dentulous, again, usually the patient has some vertical bone loss accompanied with the wearing of the dentures uh, uh, over the many years. So you don't need that much bone reduction if there's any. So let's just also check another plan. Um, and that is gonna be for the maxilla. We're gonna be trying to do the same thing on the top. On the top, again, what you wanna make sure of, or just sometimes, the angulation of the implants could be difficult if you've got the sinuses pneumatized. But in this case, we've got really good uh, distance between both the sinus on the left and right side. So we're gonna be placing six implants. So I'm gonna show you how those implants look like first from the 3D view. So we've got four straight up and down implants uh, at the sites of the canines all the way to the central incisors. And then the two terminal ones are distally inclined with a 30 degree inclination as well. And you can see that those implants are perfectly parallel to each other, just like what we had with the mandible. And then what you do is that you restore the anterior implants with straight multi-units, the distal ones with 30 degree multi-units. Again, if the sinus is pneumatized, you don't actually have to tip the implants that far distally. You've, you've got up to 17 degree. So if the arch form is not gonna be that far off distally, or if you're not gonna be restoring to the first, by, uh, first molar site, you can actually have those implants angled less with 17 degree inclination instead of 30 and restore them with the multi-units that are 17 degrees. So let's just go over to each implant site again. We're going to start with the anterior implants, number eight. So here is number eight, the cross-sectional view. That is a 3.3 by 12. Again, we have the implant emerging out of the singulum or slightly a bit lingual to the, um, sorry, to the singulum. We've got good bone support on both the buccal and the lingual surfaces. And if we rotate, you'll be able to see the nasopatine. And we've made sure that the distance from the nasopatine is more than 1.5 to 2 millimeters. Um, the next implant we've got is number nine. Again, we've made sure that the threads are not going to be encroaching on the nerve. We've got good bone support on both the buccal and the lingual surfaces. And the inclination or the angulation of the implant is going to be towards the cingulum or slightly a bit lingual. And those are the canine implants, number six. Same thing here, looks really good. And number 11, again, looks good. So right now those implants is pretty much straightforward. Um, let's move on to the distal ones. So let's start with the one on the patient's right side, number four. So this here is the angled implant, and that is a 4.1 by 12. I can even place in a 4.8 since even though we're not gonna have too much of the, uh, the forces or the cantilever forces falling on this implant, but usually we would like to have a, a bigger implant for the distally inclined ones. Um, and that is a 4.1 by 12. And what we notice here, it is just, as you can see, it is perfectly parallel to the long axis of the medial of the sinus. Um, and that is the 30 degree inclination. But if you don't need that much inclination, you can tip the implant around 15 more degrees more anteriorly and push the whole body of the implant back 
and it's, it's going to be the same thing. The only difference is the multi-unit button being going to be using to restore it. So even if we're going to be engaging a bit of the cortical lining, it should be okay. That sometimes add to, adds to the stability of the implant. Here is how it looks like from the cross section. And if we have apically or the apical third of these implants a distance less than two millimeters, because of, of course you noted the least minimum distance we should have between implants is three millimeters, it's not going to be um, it's not going to be a big deal. The reason why is that the distance between the platforms or the prosthetic platforms of the implants is going to be definitely more than three millimeters. Right now we've got around 8.7, close to nine millimeters distance, which is going to be the most important part about those implants. So those, as long as the distance between them is more than three, you should be fine. I would say it is acceptable to have less than three millimeters apically, as long as the implants are not less than a millimeter or touching each other. So that is the distal implant on the right side. Let's see the one on the left side right here again the distance apically looks like it is going to be close to two millimeters, but at, at the top or the platform right here, it looks like we've got even more, almost the same distance, right? Eight and a half to nine millimeters. Um, again, the long axis of the implant is parallel to the medial of the sinus. And it looks really good from the cross section of you, good bone support. And the only difference is that the, the upper arch, the bone quality is a bit less. So you need some additional surgical procedures like either undersizing the osteotomies or bone expansion. And what I want to do right now is show you how the occlusal view would look like with all six implants right here. And I think they look really good. And those are the distally inclined ones emerging out of the central fossa of the molar crowns. So that is just planning to have the arch accommodate, the full arch fixed prosthesis. Um, whether you're going to be immediately loading or not, this could be just followed. Again, either distally inclining the implants or having them straight up and down if the arch or the sinuses are not pneumatized. Depends on the case and depends on your preference and the guidelines you follow. Um, but in three diagnostics, what we do also provide, as mentioned before, is a guided full mouth restoration. And what we do is once we plan the implants, once we've got everything done with the software virtually, is we have a virtual wax up done. And that is going to be depending on the patient's occlusion. So as mentioned before, we need the upper and lower models. And those lower models are going to be articulated virtually. And then depending on the patient's occlusion, we're going to go ahead and redesign or have a wax up done showing the final prosthesis and how it's going to look like. So what I'm going to show you right now is Again, the upper and lower arches being articulated, so those are the patient's actual teeth. But let's just remove the lower arch and place in the wax up. So this is a wax up that we did, and what we did with the wax up is we made sure that the midlines match, canine relation is in class one, the molar relationship is also in class one with the opposing, and this right here is going to represent the finer prosthesis you're going to use to pick up the implants. So I just want to hide this. Here's how it looks like from the occlusal view. And since this is going to be a provisional PMA prosthesis, what we've done, if you notice, is that we removed the second bicuspid out of the occlusion. And the reason why is for provisionals, of course, we want to have less forces falling on these implants because they're still integrating. So we, we just decrease the span of the restorations up to the first molar and we remove the second bicuspid. And what I'm going to show you right now is how they look like from the cross section. And I can actually compare that with the patient's actual dentition. So the one that is in blue, I mean in yellow, I'm really sorry, the one that is in yellow, this is the wax up, the orange one that is the actual patient dentition or anatomy. So you can see that there's a slight difference, but the patient came in with class one occlusion anyway. There was not too much abnormalities with the occlusion. So what we've done is we've just enhanced the, um, the wax up and how the final process is gonna look like. And we can still use that as reference. So what I would do is I would hide the patient's SDL file, that is the actual SDL file, just keep the wax up and go over each implant site again, just making sure that the position of the implant looks good. Um, right here, for example, this is number 20. You can see that it is perfectly emerging out of the central fossa. This, by the way, is the cross section of the molar crown in the virtual wax up and looks really good. And we can also take a look at the occlusal view right here. And the anterior implants, 
pretty much emerging out of the uh, cingulum area of both number 23 and 26. Finally, the distal implant on the patient's right side, also emerging out of the central fossa. So what we do, once we're done with the virtual wax up, we go back to the plan again, make sure that the implants are emerging in a good relation with the wax up. Um, sometimes we need some minor adjustments. Once we're done, we go ahead and print the guide. And we're gonna take this design right here. We're gonna export it and mail the, uh, the uh, design. So you'd have a final PMA prosthesis that you can load the implants at the same day. So that's the, uh, the process of having a PMA prosthesis and a virtual wax up made. Again, just to make sure everything looks good with the, with the final outcome. And um, what we do is then we design holes for the pickup on the occlusal surface of the prosthesis and ready to go. So this is basically what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, I just wanted to show you how we approach the different treatment plans for a patient and how we plan an over um, uh, implants to accommodate an overdenture and how to plan for a fixed prosthesis. Um, if you have any questions, we're gonna be pausing for a couple of minutes to answer all the questions. So let me go ahead and check the Q&A box. Okay, so could you please explain how to select the drill length according to the sleeves? Okay, so let me go ahead and do that right now. So we're gonna be placing a sleeve uh, for this implant, for example. So number 23, I'm gonna go ahead and place in the sleeve. This software, by the way, has the stock sleeves for the Strawman system. So I'm gonna go ahead and place it. And what we do, if we know Strawman's um, protocol, Strawman has three different types of heights for the sleeves. So H2, 4, and 6. And that would reference the distance from the bottom of the sleeve all the way to the platform of the implant. So whether we choose an H2, H4, or H6, the software will actually tell us the drills that we need to use. So right here, it says the drill length. You're going to use the long drills. And the drill handles to use with the sleeve and the long drills is the one dot drill handles. If we switch this to the H4, right now you're going to use the long drills and the three dot drill handles. In H2, you're going to be using the medium drills and the single dot drill handles. So basically, the software tells us what you need to use with the Strawman system um, once you've chosen a height for a sleeve or once you've made sure that the plan looks good. And the software generates this automatically. We have another question. Um, how do you line the wax up with, in the program? So uh, usually uh, we design this using um, um, the patient's occlusion. And once we're done, we import it into the patient's software and make sure it's aligned perfectly with the patient's upper arch. But again, as mentioned, we use the opposing arch to make sure that that virtual wax up is gonna look good. And the final outcome is gonna be a class one prosthesis without any problems. Um, okay, so can you elaborate on measuring 30 degrees from max cuspids? Um, okay, so let's move on to the max again. So there are different ways um, to, um, to tilt the implant 30 degrees. Um, one of them being just having the implant perfectly parallel to the existing implants and what you do. So let me go ahead and have this implant made parallel to those anterior implants. By the way, there's a feature here that makes the implants parallel. You just need to select the master implant and the implants that should follow the angulation of that implant right here. So we're gonna make number four parallel to number six. As you can see, they're perfectly parallel. What I'm gonna do right now is when I get the mesial distal view and right click and hold and distally incline the implant, you can see that right above the cursor, there is gonna be a measurement of the uh, angulation. So right now that is around 17 to 18 degrees distal to the actual position we had the implant in. So we're gonna go ahead and keep on going up to I reach 30 degrees right over here. Once I've done that, I'm gonna go ahead and place the implant back. So that should be exactly 30 degrees off of the implant we made the uh, number four parallel with. So that's one of the ways. The other way is to have the implant have the same long axis of the existing teeth, for example. So we have the bite cuspids here. We make sure that the implant is angled uh, or perfectly parallel to the long axis. And then using that, you can go ahead and just incline the implant 30 degrees back. Just like that. So there is also a third way, which is just following the long axis of the sinuses. Um, again, you cannot go more than 30 or actually if you did, it shouldn't be a problem. It's gonna be off by five or 
or 10 degrees, which should be okay. You can still restore the arch and parallelism between the implants would still be okay. But you basically got three ways, either having the implants parallel and then this will be inclining the implant 30 degrees to the distal or having the implant planned with the same long axis of the existing teeth if the patient has any, and then tipping the implant distally, or just planning the implant being perfectly parallel to the medial of the sinus. So let's check if we have any more questions. Um, I don't think we do. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna be waiting for a minute. So we have um, any other questions? I think there are uh, some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, okay, so doesn't the software tell what optimum implant size and drill length to use for this particular case? Uh, for the implant size, this is gonna be, or it's gonna be your judgment actually. Um, the implant size would depend on whether you wanna have a beefier implant or just a smaller implant depending on um, the drilling sequence you wanna have or if you don't feel like placing a wider implant. So that would, would depend of course on your preference. And for the drill length, um, we actually did see that in this uh, just um, a couple of minutes ago. The drill length is actually, if you're gonna be using Stroma, for example, the software is gonna automatically generate um, a recipe or just an instruction of how the uh, drilling sequence is gonna look like and the length and also the drill handles to use with those sleeves to accommodate the depth of the osteotomy. Um, let's see, we do have another question. Is, there, is this the only way we can position these two implants? I'm not sure. Um, can you please elaborate which two implants? Um, you mean the distal the inclined implants, I guess? Okay. Um, okay, I think we do have more questions in the Q&A box. How deep do you plan your implants? Again, that would depend on the vertical clearance we need to have according to what we were given, 15 to 17 millimeters if the patient has existing teeth. Um, if not, if you're just having a, a plan done for a completely dentulous patient, this is the reason why we scan the patient with a dual scan to see how the video looks like. So once we do have the information of the patient's and dentition, measure 15 to 17 or even more uh, distance from the platform of the implants to the occlusal table. So that would determine how deep the implants would go. Sometimes you are um, bounded by how much bone support you've got, which is still going to be good. I mean, if you place the implants deeper and if you have more than 17 millimeters to the closer table, it shouldn't be a problem. That all is going to be compensated with the prosthesis. Um, how do you make the surgical seat after the extractions are done? Um, basically, what we do is we, we do something called the bone segmentation, is that we hollow out the arch. I just want to show you how this would look like right now. Um, right here. So what we do is we segment both the patient's arch and the teeth, as you can see, and both are completely different segmentations or conversions, what we like to call them. And once we have done that, we take the teeth out right here, and we end up having the bone only with the socket without the teeth. So this is basically what we're gonna be uh, using to design the surgical guide to seat on the bone, um, given of course the extractions, and we remove the teeth and just have the bone with the socket. So it's gonna be more or less the same way once you're done the extractions, even um, sometimes the extractions could be a bit more traumatic, but if the whole arch is designed the same way or the guide is designed the same way, one site where the extraction is a bit more traumatic is not gonna make that much difference and the guide should, as long as, as, as the spam is long enough to cover it, most of the arch is gonna seat well. Um, when torque implant, we don't know position is an edge or area of hex. So how do you choose the angle of the multi-unit? So uh, when we provide you with a prosthesis or a full arch restoration, we still also provide you with a guide called an abutment guide. And that guide is gonna have um, notches on the buccal surface or where the flat surface of the internal hex would be. So one, the implant surgical guide where you use to place the implants through is also gonna have that notch. So you'd need to line up the dots on the implant driver or the mount with that notch, know which surface of the hex is gonna be facing that notch once you've done that. So the timing of the implant depends on the guide and the notch in the guide, and you need that to line up with the, uh, 
with the dots on the driver. Once you've done that, you place the abutment guide in and to place the multi-units, you also need to follow the notch that is on the abutment guide to know where exactly you need to place them in, in which timing or which orientation. Okay, um, I think that's it. I, I don't think we have any other questions. Okay, awesome. So um, please uh, make sure not to miss Dr. Uh, Resnick's webinar next week, which is gonna be a, a part two of the CBCT planning webinar we had last week. It is gonna be next Tuesday. And thank you so much for attending. Again, it was a pleasure. I hope you stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you and have a good day.